Hey everyone, thanks for joining us here on Reluctant Preppers. Asking for your help tonight, because even though we have record numbers of subscribers here on Reluctant Preppers, trying to spread the word about preparedness and self-reliance and awareness, we've been receiving reduced revenue from our YouTube videos being marked as advertiser unfriendly and having to curtail the content and the descriptions and the topics and the guests that we can introduce. So with your help, we can overcome that and break free of that restriction. If you go to patreon.com slash reluctant preppers, you can make any amount of small or modest or larger monthly donation to help support our mission. We've established goals there to help bring you even more content with the different levels that we can achieve together. Thanks folks, check it out, patreon.com slash reluctant preppers. And now on to our main event. As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We're privileged to have a returning guest tonight. He is the founder and host of WhatReallyHappened.com. He is formerly of Hollywood special effects uh, renown, and also, after having uh, left that business, uh, started as a investigative and uh, journalist exposing the truth behind the stories, telling all of the things you're not going to hear on the mainstream media about what's really happening in our world. He's Michael Rivero. He's back with us again here on Reluctant Preppers. Mike, thanks for joining us once again. Thank you for having me again. If we could kick off tonight by talking about escalating tensions in Syria and potential, the real potential for conflict uh, of, a, of a serious nature between the United States and Russia that could uh, erupt from that, if you could just tell us what, what is the narrative that the mainstream media has been feeding us and what's really going on that we aren't being told that we should be paying attention to? Well, the mainstream media narrative and the government official line is that uh, the U.S. government has inserted itself into Syria as part of the war on terror to fight ISIS and al-Qaeda. Of course, uh, the Syrian government has not asked for the U.S. to intervene. The Syrian government has not granted permission to the United States to be inside Syria. Congress has not uh, issued a formal declaration of war. There is no United Nations Security Council resolution. So the United States really does not have any legal right to be in Syria. It is a de facto invasion. And more and more we are seeing that the United States isn't really targeting uh, ISIS and al-Qaeda. They're targeting Syrian forces and in fact uh, the Syrian uh, forces are complaining that the U.S. seems intent on protecting ISIS. There have been uh, several instances where the U.S. is literally bombing holes in the Syrian forces' line through which ISIS can escape uh, to fight again. And the U.S. has shot down four, uh, uh, rather basically attacked four uh, different times convoys and Syrian forces. Most recently was the shoot down of a Syrian Sukhoi-22 uh, aircraft that happened yesterday. And uh, the official U.S. position is this aircraft was threatening the U.S.-backed rebels. And both Damascus and Russia are saying, in point of fact, uh, this aircraft was targeting ISIS uh, and didn't even get to do that. It was shot down before it actually went on its uh, uh, mission. Uh, and so as a result, Russia has terminated the uh, agreement with the United States to coordinate airstrikes and keep out of each other's way. Russia has, for all intents and purposes, declared a no-fly zone over Syria west of the Euphrates River, uh, basically saying that only Syrian and Russian aircraft will be allowed in there uh, and that any other aircraft that come on in will be tracked and uh, viewed as a potential target. They'll be asked to leave, and if they do not, they face the possibility of being shot down. And apparently the threat was serious enough where the Australian Air Force has now pulled out of uh, air operations over Syria. Uh, they're just going to keep their planes and pilots safe at home. But the uh, situation is clearly uh, escalating, uh, and uh, very obviously the United States is back to their original agenda. They want to replace Bashar al-Assad with a Western-centric, Western-friendly puppet ruler. It's another regime change. They've been trying to do this for five years now, uh, and it's rapidly escalating, and obviously there needs to be a concern about uh, actual conflict between American and Russian forces. There was another incident that took place uh, over the Black Sea where a U.S. surveillance aircraft was apparently spying on Russia's Baltic fleet, uh, and a Russian fighter came up to basically warn him off 
uh, the U.S. is claiming that the uh, rather that uh, uh, the uh, Russian fighter was the provocateur and uh, was flying unsafe. Uh, and of course, Russia is saying that uh, uh, they have a right to keep spy planes away from their equipment. So uh, the, the, the words are going back and forth, but very obviously we're seeing this uh, continuing provocation and escalation from the U.S. government. And more and more analysts are saying this is heading to an open clash between the U.S. and Russia and a new world war. And obviously people are very concerned. If it were to go global, uh, it might actually go nuclear. And as I live on the island of Oahu, I can look out my little office window here and see Pearl Harbor, which means things would get very interesting here for Claire and I. If we could dig into, I guess, three aspects of what you just talked about. Um, first of all, there was this big scandal during the Trump presidential campaign of um, people. He made some, as he did often, very provocative statements, uh, something about uh uh, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton being the founders of ISIS and then the, the press started to try to pick away at him and say, surely you can't mean what you said surely you can't mean what you said and he kept like reiterating that and then in layers and upon layers if you peel that back for us can you tell us what, what would be the, the threads of truth if any behind that as far as the the ISIS springing from Al Qaeda Al Qaeda being off the power vacuum and so on is there any is there any threads of truth to that kind of a provocative statement um, absolutely there is because as it turns out between WikiLeaks and documents uh, that were obtained by Judicial Watch uh, it turns out the US government uh, at the same time they're telling us ISIS and Al Qaeda are our enemies in the war on terror uh, they were within Syria uh, arming and supplying them and using them as a proxy against Bashar al-Assad. Uh, and they were basically smuggling weapons that had been used in Libya uh, to uh, get rid of Muammar Gaddafi. They were smuggling them into Syria using that consulate in Benghazi as the hub. And that's what led to that whole disaster as well. But there is a very long documentary trail showing that, yes, the U.S. government was in fact arming and supplying uh, ISIS and al-Qaeda uh, to use as these proxies. The, ISIS especially, it's a made-up group, uh, mostly of mercenaries. And uh, again, it's out there fighting the war the U.S. wants it to fight, which is against Bashar al-Assad. Second aspect of what you were talked about was um, the real escalating tensions between the U.S. and Russia, which could uh, turn dangerous and ugly. Uh, so at the same time, this nonstop drumbeat that we've been hearing for the over the past month it's got to be going on three months or shoot must if you really look at it, it's going back to the to the election where they were claim, making claims about uh the trump campaign being in cahoots with uh, russia and cozying up to russia and how how trump and uh and uh, you know the head of russia are, are just you know uh, way too close and cozy and then even more recently these various scandals of uh insinuating that his his uh, advisors and so on had direct ties back to back to russia during during the early parts of the administration before they even were in in power and at the same time so you've got the the whole narrative is saying Trump and Russia are too close. Trump and Russia are cozy. Trump and Russia are in cahoots. And then what you're saying is, uh, the U.S. Meanwhile, the reality is, the U.S. is 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 very acting very, and the U.S. and Russia acting very provocative towards each other. So, can you tell us what's going on here with this dichotomy of what the what we're talking about in the news versus what's actually happening? Well, what's going on? First of all, it, the U.S. is the belligerent party. Putin has been trying to uh, adopt a more adult posture. Uh, he does not want this thing to escalate and spin out of control. So he's trying very hard to send a message saying this has gone on far enough. The U.S. needs to back off all of this regime change in all these countries or things are going to go out of control. Now, so far, uh, nobody has found any evidence whatsoever of any kind of collusion uh, between Trump's campaign uh, and the Russians. And Oliver Stone, when he was on uh, Stephen Colbert's show the other day, uh, made a very valid uh, observation that for all this talk about Russia tinkering with our internal politics, Israel tinkers with our politics all the time. Nobody seems to make a big deal about it. And, of course, CBS edited that out of the broadcast version of the show because uh, you're not allowed to remind everybody to the, the extent 
extent to which Israel does interfere with our politics. And the U.S. interferes with other countries' politics. They've tampered with over 80 elections as part of their, uh, uh, in foreign countries, as part of their regime change agenda. And as far as Trump meeting with the Russian ambassador or the rest of it, meeting foreign dignitaries is part of the job description. The only person who seems to actually have a compromising link is Jared Kushner, uh, who apparently uh, was being offered uh, financial support uh, to deal with some of his debt issues coming out of his failed hedge fund uh, by a Russian bank uh, who expected a quid pro quo for that. And there, there is talk now that Jared Kushner is now being pushed away from the Oval Office and uh, may soon depart. But other than that, uh, there's absolutely no evidence. And the Democrats are out there saying, well, the fact that we found absolutely no evidence just only goes to show that we've got to investigate more. We have to know if the president is compromised by Russia. Meanwhile, you had Hillary Clinton, uh, who got millions of dollars from Russia uh, to help facilitate the Uranium One deal, where this Russian company acquired 20 percent of the uranium ore inside the United States of America, and that was all put together uh, by Hillary Clinton. And so there's this incredible bias of trying to make up crimes and scandals for Donald Trump, uh, while at the same time just absolutely ignoring the very real crimes for which we have evidence of. When James Comey uh, gave that press conference about Hillary's email scandal, he went down the list of felony Title 18 violations she'd committed, then he said, we don't recommend her being prosecuted because she didn't mean to do wrong. And there are two problems with that statement. Title 18 does not require intent. Uh, if you accidentally, mistakenly uh, put uh, classified information where it can be seen, you can still go to prison. Second, it's not the FBI's job to recommend prosecution or not. That belongs solely to the attorney general. And so, uh, the, again, the indications are James Comey and Loretta Lynch were protecting Hillary Clinton, by which I mean they're protecting the narcocracy, which has been poisoning this country's politics for going on 30 years. And History Channel is actually running a four-part series on America's drug war, where they actually talk about how the Central Intelligence Agency has been bringing illegal drugs into this country and selling them in order to fund clandestine operations not approved by Congress. And uh, the, the, the plan between the Bushes and the Clintons, who are both allied on this, was to turn the White House into a dynastic uh, inheritance, to hand off from Bush to Clinton to Clinton to Bush to Bush to Clinton. Obama got on the inside uh, in 2008 because everybody was so freaked out about Ron Paul, but he was willing to go along uh, with this deal of keeping uh, certain secrets. Donald Trump isn't like that. And I think the deep state uh, is in a panic that uh, Trump could all of a sudden decide to say, we're going to start looking at this issue of CIA drug running, especially now that History Channel has made it ex socially acceptable to talk about this. The third thing I was hoping we could probe from that first opening, um, uh, you know, uh, dis discussion that you brought out there was about what about U.S.-Russian hostilities and what are the real and present dangers that you think would could credibly escalate from such hostilities that are, that are in progress? Well, my concerns are, first of all, that America's weapons, for all the money that they cost, they're not really built very well. We got a demonstration of that yesterday when uh, apparently the USS Fitzgerald uh, tried to run around the front of a cargo ship and it got hit. And by the way, that's a violation of the rules of right of way under maritime law. Those big cargo ships and super tankers, uh, they have the right of way. The other guy has to back off. Uh, we've seen it with the F-22, which is still asphyxiating its pilots. Now the F-35, which is considered the biggest military boondoggle in all of U.S. history, uh, is having problems with its air system uh, going to the pilots. Uh, same thing with uh, the uh, F-18s. They're developing all of these problems. The F-35 can't fly in rain, can't fly in fog. The software for the onboard cannon... Uh, is not going to be ready for a couple of years. Uh, when it test fires, the cannon it has so much recoil, it's actually damaging the wing route. Uh, and the Gerald R. Ford uh, has now been officially delivered to the Navy. It's got all kinds of major problems with its magnetic rail catapult and arrestor system to where uh, F-18s cannot carry a full battle load off the deck, uh, thereby limiting their effectiveness. Uh, the uh, Freedom Class... 
uh, littoral combat ships, constant drivetrain problems, uh, the independence class littoral combat ships, chronic hull corrosion, the Zumwalt stealth destroyer, same thing, chronic drivetrain problems, and on and on. And the reason for that is simply that the military industrial complex in the United States is all about making money all about building these big, bloated, lots of gadgets and gizmos uh, to maximize profit under the cost plus contracts. And they're not really effective fighting platforms. Now, in places like Russia and China that don't spend anywhere near the money the United States does, uh, their goal is to make a cost-effective, efficient weapon. And so as a result, the fact that the United States does spend all this money on the machinery of war I don't think is a guarantee of uh, victory. And my concern is that when the U.S. government realizes it cannot win a conventional war against a military peer, that they may resort to the nuclear weapons. And that, of course, is going to be a bad day for anybody not wearing two million sunblock. <laughs> We'd like to switch over to some viewer questions now. Um, we have one uh, by, submitted by I Know Your Comments, uh, and I'll, I'll restate it. Uh, it came in as, Michael, would you consider putting together an article or a video of the best 100% facts for sharing to the sheeple? And I know that when people uh, submit comments here, they often talk about how are they going to bring up topics with people. Uh, they use, we use the term sheeple, meaning you know people who are just yes. um, innocent and, and kind of ignorant because that's what, that's what we do, do the herd mentality, all that sort of thing. So when we're trying to bring up topics with people who are really under the spell, they're in the trance still of the mainstream media and whatever the powers that be are, are telling them, what are, what are your maybe top three, if you wanted to think about it, or just the top few, if you would bring up you know, your, your Mike's top hit list of 100, 100% truths that people aren't being told. If you if you can only have a few minutes or a, a half hour with somebody, and you really want to get them to consider that maybe they haven't been being told the whole story, what are a couple real discussion starters or thought starters that, that might be helpful to bring out? Well, the first one I lead off with, of course, is Saddam's nuclear weapons, which turned out not to exist. Uh, but in terms of talking to people, uh, le rather than give you facts to throw at them, let me give you a little bit of guidance. First of all, generally keep it low-key and light. Don't overwhelm them or the defense mechanisms are going to kick on in. The art of being a rabble rouser is knowing what the rabble is ready to listen to and what they don't want to hear yet. And there are people who are in denial. They do not want to know what's gone wrong with this country. They're living in their little comfortable bubble, uh, and they really don't want to know. And if you find somebody like that, then just ignore them. Uh, you should keep a lookout for the people who are ready to ask questions and just be there with the answers and let them ask the questions let them direct the information flow uh, but uh, again starting out with the lie about Saddam's nuclear weapons uh, you're gonna say you were lied to about that you were lied to about human caused global warming back in 2000 they said snow was a thing of the past and look at all these record winters and uh, just take it forward from there but again tread lightly don't overwhelm them uh, you can't push somebody across a bridge. You have to stand on the other side and beckon them across. Let it be their journey of discovery. Okay. Um, the next two are both from Captain Birdseye. They have to do with uh, currency and how long it... First, the first one is, how long does Mike estimate the present debt-based Ponzi scheme currency can survive? Well, uh, it's kind of hard to prognosticate because, unfortunately, the people who are running the banks and running uh, the governments uh, change the rules all the time to try and kick that can down the road. And what I foresee ultimately happening, uh, because of economic globalism, uh, I'm seeing all these private central banks possibly collapsing at the exact same time. And that will be a once-in-a-lifetime uh, opportunity to get away from this debt-based currency and go back to an honest money system. Uh, but if you go over to my website, uh, there's an article up in that little gray box in the top, All Wars Are Bankers Wars, and you really need to read that to understand just how these bankers have dominated our country's history, including wars and assassinations. And you need to understand private central banks do not exist to serve the people and the community. They exist to serve themselves. And it was the enslavement to a similar bank uh, that led to the first American Revolution. 
And of course, 100 years ago, when we got our latest private central bank, the Federal Reserve, which, by the way, is no more federal than Federal Express, the school stopped teaching about King George III's Currency Act. And they just sort of rebranded and said, it's tea in Boston Harbor, and it's Paul Revere's ride, and it's the Stamp Act. Because they didn't want people realizing that we were back in that same economic slavery uh, that had led to the first revolution. So as far as how long it's going to last, uh, uh, I'm amazed it has lasted uh, to this point right now. Uh, but I would say it feels like it's imminent, uh, and uh, everybody needs to be prepared for that. And that means building a, a sense of community with your friends and your neighbors. It means uh, having storable food, storable water, uh, delinking as much as possible from those corporate supply chains. Uh, because if you're still dependent on those corporate supply chains, when the economy tanks, uh, they're, 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 they're going to shut down. They're going to collapse, and you're going to be... Uh, 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 in real serious trouble. And uh, I'm sure down there, there's going to be a joke. How do you tell a prepper? They're the ones not eating out of the trash dumpsters. Yeah. <laughs> I think you've shared that one with us before, but it always cracks me up when you do, because uh, this is being played out, unfortunately, tragically, in some South American countries at the moment. You know, we've seen yes. that over the last couple of quarters. And uh, people have, have said, you know, look at, look at what what was happening in Greece, look what's been happening, what's been teetering on the edge of in certain times for Italy, for Spain, as well as uh, other areas of the world. And you, you can see, and also uh, Japan being ahead of the U.S. demographically, uh, closer to a, a demographic collapse there as well, when there's not going to be anybody else. That's the old saying, how can you tell a liberal is when they finally uh, finally run out of other people's money to spend. And, and the ability for uh, a aging population to be supported by uh, the younger population that's shrinking is, is really getting to critical proportions uh, in Japan. So as far as this isn't theoretical, it's, it's happening before our eyes. Well, it's, it's starting to happen here in the U.S. Birth rates are in decline, and whether that's because of the economy or uh, the escape of the epicyte gene into the wild, uh, but, uh, yeah, the American population is in decline. Maybe that's why they're bringing in all these illegal immigrants and these refugees uh, to try and keep our population up. Uh, but these are not going to be productive, supportive people on which you could uh, take care of that older generation. Uh, most of these uh, individuals are coming on in, and they're basically helping themselves to all kinds of goodies. These refugees are actually getting more financial support from the U.S. government than our veterans are. Yeah, it's um it's been distressing to a lot of people that um they've you know worked hard their whole life and uh, and and scrimped and saved and then they and then they start to see uh, things being handed out to others as though there's an entitlement there that was never earned. We we've had you know recently a multi generational family gathering uh, in our town of our of our extended family and. Uh, being able to hear the the wisdom from the oldest generation, the oldest members of the family tree, uh, reflecting on that, who made it through the Great Depression, who made it through World War II, who made it through all those decades, and uh, just shaking their head and saying exactly what you were just saying. And, you know, you have to pay attention when someone with that much life experience is saying it. Yeah, you, you do, because we, we've seen the patterns of history. I've uh, been running my website here for uh, over 20 years, and... I have during that time just seen this inexorable increase of corruption in high places and this relentless march to a new war. Uh, we are unfortunately in a time where the, the government and the bankers have pretty much destroyed this economy. Uh, and the only thing they can think of doing is getting into a major war uh, so that they've got something to blame it all on if not fix it. And this is a repeating pattern because uh, cr crash of 1907, World War I, crash of 1929, World War II, crash of 2008. Here we are going head to head with the Russians. We uh, recently attended the uh, Ron Paul Institute's Peace and Prosperity Conference in Washington, D.C., and there were speakers of all types from uh, Ron Paul to uh, uh, R Richard Llewellyn to, or, excuse me, Lou Rockwell, and uh, also... Uh, uh, Congressman Tom Massey uh, and so on talking about the deep state as well as the, what you were talking about as far as the, the the county that we were in there being the only county that hasn't suffered uh, from this recession since 2008 and uh, the only one where there is no downturn is is where the federal government just continues to prop itself up on, on its own you know it as though it doesn't need the people you can just go on surviving by itself and um, that well back to the economic question there uh, the same 
Captain Bird's Eye also asks, do you favor uh, value-based currency, for example, a unit of electricity backing a value-based currency? Absolutely. Absolutely. This idea uh, of a debt-based economy, it's a Ponzi scheme. Uh, it is naturally unstable. Uh, it's never going to perpetuate. Uh, and uh, uh, again, it is a way of siphoning off the wealth created by the labor of the people and putting it into the pockets of those bankers. And sooner or later, uh, it will collapse. Now, in times past, when one of these private central bank systems collapsed, all of the other nations enslaved to their private central banks would pour money in and reset and restart the system. But again today, because of economic globalism, uh, the whole system uh, could possibly come crashing down all at once. And I think the people of planet Earth need to be ready to stand on up and say, no more of this uh, you know, legalized counterfeiting. Uh, you know, we want an honest money system uh, on which to build a new country. You know, something you just mentioned a minute ago about um, the military industrial complex is the only thing going. They're still trying to make it look like the economy is, is, is healthy, but it, it isn't. And uh, people, when you talk to them, they really they do have this sense of two things. There's this, there's a split reality. One is, well, the stock market keeps hitting new highs and houses are affordable because interest rates are low. And my wife and I were just watching the television before we went to bed the other night, and there was this another ad saying, I can't remember which car company, 72 months, 0% interest. And I, it just struck me. It's like, wait a minute. That's been going on for a long time. I mean, how long does it take? It, how desperate? How desperate does the situation need to be when for over a decade, the the largest you know uh, consumer goods that people would buy have to be at free money in order for people to continue to be spurred on to to, to go ahead and buy them. It just um, seems so like the thing that people aren't talking about is like this isn't a good thing. This is an uh, this is a sign of unhealth, not of health. That that's absolutely you are absolutely correct here. And the reason those car prices are so low, and the reason they're uh, uh, practically uh, you know letting you borrow the money. Uh, at close to zero interest is nobody actually has the money uh, to buy things, whether it's houses or cars or, or any of that other stuff. And uh, the problem, of course, for most Americans is they don't have confidence and trust uh, in the economic future. And so they don't want to take on a mortgage. They don't want to take on a car loan out of fear that three months from now they could lose their job and be forced to take a lower paying job, start missing the payments, and the car gets repossessed or the home gets foreclosed on. And uh, it is uh, this lack of, of confidence uh, is a severe impediment for the economy. People aren't fooled by the stock market. Uh, most people know it's being manipulated to use as a political banner. And the vast majority of Americans are not in the stock market anyway. So what the stock market is doing is pretty much irrelevant to them. They're looking around at their local community. They're seeing the cracks in the pavement. They're seeing the corroded metal, the uh, retail vacancies, the hungry and the homeless. That's where they're getting their analysis of the economy from. Now, that's a, you're talking about reality versus the, the line that we're being fed. So let's take it to the next level of cryptocurrencies. For some people, they don't even know what you're talking about when you say cryptocurrencies. Most people have heard the term Bitcoin but have a hard time describing it. Um, other people think it's just the greatest thing and it's such a uh, hot new uh, game changer. And, and they talk about how we're just on the very uh, early adopter leading edge here. And mo since most people aren't in yet and, and mutual funds aren't in and main banks aren't in anything else, that if you get in now... You know, it's going to be completely life changing for you and for generational wealth transfer and all that. Other people say, wait a minute, that's just swallowing the pill and going into the matrix because now you're in a completely virtual world where there isn't, there's nothing real. Um, what, what's your take on cryptocurrencies? What do you think is the, the hype versus the truth? And if you look at it from a what's, what really happened standpoint, if you kind of project yourself out five or 10 years and look back, what, what do you believe will be the story you'll be telling about cryptocurrencies, you know, a decade from now? Uh, well, first of all, uh, if you think about it, uh, most of U.S. currency is already virtual. Uh, there's, uh, there's only a tiny fraction of the nation's uh, wealth that are in these paper and ink Federal Reserve notes. Most of it just sits in banks. It moves around from account to account. So the idea of a virtual currency isn't all that new. Now, my concern about uh, Bitcoin is uh, it is subject to manipulation like any other virtual currency. We saw that with the Japanese run-up followed by uh, the dip afterwards. And uh, again, I, I think we need to go back to an honest 
money system where th- th- there's a unit of value attached to it, a commodity base that everybody understands has got a certain worth, whether that's silver, gold, copper, electricity, who knows. But the idea uh, of having a virtual currency, uh, it, it, it seems too open to manipulation. And as a matter of fact, one of the virtual currencies uh, was just banned here in Hawaii. Uh, uh, under allegations that there was fraud manipulation going on. And there have been some of these Bitcoin exchanges that have gotten into trouble. Uh, And I think in the end, most people uh, really do want their money in their own hand because it's an automatic limiting factor. When you go out to the store and and, and you're buying stuff, you see how much money you have left, and you'll say, "Ah, maybe I don't want to buy this little whiz bank. Uh, The bankers love those plastic cards because you spend, spend, spend without regard, and you can get in over your head very, very quickly. Plus, again, we're seeing an epidemic of computer crime uh, that is affecting uh, some of the cryptocurrencies along with those plastic cards. Moving on, the next person is talking about what can an ordinary person do about it. Uh, This is Rasputin's Ghost writes, Hi guys, Mike. It seems to me the only voice that people truly have is to stock up and stay home. Would one week of a general strike do it? I don't see a way forward maybe because it doesn't include me. It's a pretty desperate uh, statement or a grim statement thinking that there is no uh, future for for us as individuals unless we do something. And this is kind of taking the role of would it make a difference for people to, as you had said earlier, unplug from the system and refuse to participate in the system? What do you think would be the most effective way, the most impactful, the most materially meaningful way for people to unplug or to to disengage from from a, a corrupt system? Well, the first thing I would do is just turn off that corporate media. Don't buy the newspapers. Don't buy the magazines. Don't buy the the, the booklets and pamphlets. And just ignore uh, those uh, network news channels on your cable box. I know you can't get them uh, unplugged and disconnected, but just ignore them uh, and go on out and find the information for yourself so that you can make really good choices. Uh, As far as a general strike, obviously Gandhi used those to tremendous effect uh, in breaking India free of Great Britain, and at some point down the road they may work here. Uh, But I get a lot of emails similar to that message. People are very angry. Uh, they're disenchanted. They're seeing uh, the, the machinery of government and media literally trying to stage a coup d'etat against the president we, the voters, put on in. Uh, the Democrats are dealing with their own situation with this class action lawsuit against the DNC uh, for uh, uh, basically cheating the Bernie Sanders supporters by giving the nomination to Hillary Clinton. So people are feeling very disenfranchised. Uh, they're 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 feeling very threatened by the potential of a global war. They're feeling very displaced by all the illegal immigrants and refugees pouring into their country. And we know all of this is part of this globalist new world order agenda. And people just don't want to give up their sovereignty, their town, their community, uh, and their and most importantly their identity. And that is really under attack right now. That's part of the globalist agenda to get us to forget who we are. That's where you get all the Confederate flags being banned and the statues being torn down and trying to even get us confused over which restroom we're supposed to use because people who have a strong sense of who they are are much more difficult to control than people who are just totally confused about what's supposed to be going on. And so that's, that's a big reason why they're going after the flags and going after the statues and the pins and so forth. On that topic of uh, globalism versus uh, nationalism, we've had Rob Kirby from Kirby Analytics on uh, several times, and he's very concerned about this, just as you described, that there's a real generational um, brainwashing that's going on of the next generation to think that you're only good, that in other words, if you if you have any patriotism or if you have any uh, pride of, of uh, family and your uh, heritage and your uh, home, mother country and that sort of thing, then you're, you're racist and you're a bigot and you're a hater. And that the only way to prove that you're uh, informed, aware, intelligent, uh, on and on, you can keep filling in the, all the, the good sounding adjectives is if you basically say there's no distinctions between anything and everybody's, everybody's uh, uh, to be, to be, um, just board, you know, open borders, open markets, open everything. And isn't that 
a sign of disease in any organism if it has no cell walls and it has no uh, healthy boundaries, uh, whether it's at, at the microscopic level or the or the you know individual organism or the entire colony. Isn't there something about a healthy, vibrant, sur- a culture that can survive, a family that can survive, to have? healthy boundaries that are people are aware of what their identity is well they need a framework for a society and that's really what's under attack right now uh, is that framework that set of uh, collective beliefs ethics morality that we're all raised with uh, that provide the basic ground rules for how we get along with our, our fellow citizens in this country and that is currently under attack one of the worst things I'm seeing happen in Europe uh, is where these uh, uh, migrants are coming into Europe from Africa and the Middle East, and they're raping women, and the judges are letting them go because, well, in their culture, uh, rape isn't wrong, and they didn't know that they were doing bad, so we're going to let these people go. Uh, We even had a case like that uh, uh, here in the United States. Five-year-old girl got raped. And the, the rapists got just a few months in prison. And that's, that's ridiculous. We have laws in this country. If you come to this country, you obey those laws. Teddy Roosevelt uh, said it, uh, you know, very, very well. He said, if you're an immigrant and you want to come to the United States of America, welcome. Just remember that you are coming to the United States of America. We have certain laws here that you must obey. We have a language here called English. And we respect your right to worship as you feel in the privacy of your own home, uh, but do understand that there is an obligation that you will fit in with our society. And George Soros and his globalist people, they're trying to basically reverse that. And as you say, anybody who stands up for their own self-identity and the sovereignty of uh, their community is deemed a racist. And it's not really being racist because illegal isn't a race. Right. Yeah, and and this various forms of language being used as bullying, which is so ironic because there's supposedly this this whole politically correct tolerance um, is supposed to be the watchword, and uh, anyone who and zero tolerance for bullying and that sort of thing, and yet bullying is precisely what's what is brought to bear against anyone who stands up for natural law or objective truth or uh, you know national national identity or any 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 part of you know identity of, of maleness or femaleness or father or mother or, or anything, um, the, the value of children, uh, you're immediately uh, a target and bullied and with name calling, that sort of thing. As a well, you know, if, if liberals didn't have double standards, they wouldn't have any standards at all. Well, let's talk a little bit about use of language there, because as a broadcaster and journalist, Mm -hmm. uh, you use language as your means of reaching out and connecting with people and and, uh, influencing people, opening people's options for what what they can even... um, are able to think because they haven't been given that those options before. Um, what is your take on the use of language uh, to intentionally, as we just said, to marginalize, to pigeonhole, to um, smear, to bully, uh, to basically shut down conversation and to shut down thought and to uh, shape the minds of the next generation and the current generation? What is? Could you talk to us a little bit about your take on what is happening to language and thought in our culture? Well, it, it's certainly being discouraged. Uh, we're uh, looking at some of the curriculum from Common Core. Uh, uh, they're, they're teaching the students rote memorization and obedience to authority. Uh, they're not teaching them how to think, how to analyze, how to self-teach. We have people coming out of college Uh, who have not developed any analytic skills according to the uh, testing being done on them and that immediately puts us at a disadvantage in that global marketplace Uh, but what the government wants is obedient believers who will go along with the uh, agenda and uh, discouraging uh, analytical thought rationality is part of that program simplifying the language I mean go back and read George Orwell's 1984 and the rationale behind Newspeak the idea that if there isn't a word for a bad idea, then people cannot get that bad idea. Right. Well, Mike, our, before we let you go, are there any other thoughts you have from your uh, research on current events that are kind of penetrate beyond what people are going to hear on the mainstream media that really would help them in their efforts, their sincere efforts to be more aware and to make their families prepared for what's truly happening, what's really happening? Well, I think the most important thing right now is everybody has to stand up and say, we've had enough of war. 
The United States government has been waging war all over the globe for 15 years. Uh, they have bankrupted our nation with this war economy, uh, and a lot of people uh, have been killed. In fact, uh, the uh, estimates are since the end of World War II, the United States government has killed over 20 million people. That's getting into Nazi territory. But we need all of the people to unite together as one people. Don't fall for all this uh, divide and conquer stuff coming out of the government, black against white, gay against straight, men against women. We all need to come together as a nation of the American people and demand our government halt this war agenda. Uh, because, frankly, I, I don't think the U.S. government can win this one, and I think it's going to go nuclear. You, something you just touched on is key. Um, even though we were lamenting the uh, the desire of globalists to sort of blur and blend and smear national boundaries and national borders and everything, there's this opposite uh a tactic, which is also to divide and conquer within a culture and to pit, to, to create the 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 narrative of you know uh, white versus black or rich versus poor or whatever to to subdivide us so that we aren't united what what do you think the average person can do that's that that's within their grasp to counteract that to not you know not fall prey to that now you mentioned one thing turn off the mainstream media so yeah you're... turn off the mainstream media be civil be polite understand that you know uh, uh, just respect the people around you but also recognize that a lot of these people who are out there trying to cause this trouble are actually paid to do that. They're agent provocateurs, and they're actually being paid money uh, to go on out and cause this ruckus. And if you want a prototype for all of this, go on back to the 1960s uh, to this huge scandal that hit the FBI called COINTELPRO. And it came out actually in the 70s. Some people stole the files from an FBI office and blew it all over the media. And it basically showed how the FBI is not the swell bunch of Joes that you see in TV shows and movies, where the FBI was going on out and sabotaging uh, uh, groups. Uh, uh, they, one of their things they did was they came up with this Black Panther coloring book that fanned the flames of, of race hate between the blacks and the whites. Uh, they went after the early feminists, the Native American movement, and their number one target was disrupting the anti-Vietnam movement, including staging a phony riot in Disneyland to discredit the movement. So this is how the government likes to play. They like to play dirty. They think it's their divine right, and you need to be prepared for that. How do you suggest people can actually separate the chaff from the wheat in that? Because as we see these riots in Ferguson, Missouri, we see these uh, you know, riots after the Trump election, we see these things. We've heard that you know, some of these are being paid for professionally. There's ads being placed, for, you know, classified ads for paid demonstrators who yes. are willing to do these things. Um, how do people... How do you recommend people can 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 sift through that, navigate through that, and realize what's really, de you know, demonstrating the voice of the people versus where are things these these things being planted? Well, you know, it's really funny if you go over to YouTube. There are all kinds of videos of these protesters being interviewed, and the host will say, "What what are you protesting for?" And they'll just stand there with a blank look on their face because they don't have a list of talking points. They're just there for the paycheck and the box lunch and uh, making as much noise as they can. And uh, it's a dead giveaway when they can't actually talk about the ideas. Uh, and again, if they resort to the bullying and the name calling, it's another admission. They don't actually have any facts uh, uh, to bring to the discussion. Uh, and so they resort to that, that, that bullying tactic uh, uh, again. Uh, but uh, it, it's, we're, we're in a crisis in this country. Uh, we, we've been seeing all this hate rhetoric coming out from the left which apparently uh, led to that shooting in Alexandria, Virginia, uh, where this, this Democrat Bernie supporter uh, shot up some GOP congressmen. Uh, and apparently he simply fell for this idea, this current climate, where they're continually telling us this sort of behavior is now becoming acceptable. And no, it's not acceptable. It was never acceptable. And but again, the media and the liberal left and the Hillaryites all have to share the responsibility for this constant harangue of it's OK to hunt Republicans. It's OK to kill the president. Remember that thing yeah. with Kathy Griffin. Right. Uh, and they've created this climate that could overflow into a civil war if somebody doesn't tamp it down. Well, as you point out, each of us is uh, not only free to 
choose our response to this um, external situations to every we are we are free to choose our actions and we in our own lives in our sphere of you know influence and control the thing person we can control the most is ourselves so we need to be as you point out be civil but also uh as we're trying not to overreact to false stimulus is to is to unplug from it because we are being inundated with it and to just to opt out of that so i guess that that really brings us back to why we had you on um, from what really happened. And if people like what they're hearing from you and want to find out more of your work, it's not just on whatreallyhappened.com, uh, but where else can they find you as well, Mike? I do a daily talk show Monday through Friday from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. Central United States time on the Republic Broadcasting Network. And if you go to my website, whatreallyhappened.com, there's a little uh, uh, link that appears during the show time where you can uh, go listen to the audio at RBN. There's even a BAM user TV feed. Well, Mike Rivero, founder of WhatReallyHappened.com, we always appreciate you joining us here on Reluctant Preppers and really opening our eyes to, to options we are not going to hear elsewhere. So thank you once again for joining us here on Reluctant Preppers. Thank you for having me.